I found, first of all, I found the, the film pretty romantic. Am I crazy or do you agree? No, I think it's very romantic. It's necromantic. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. It's like a kind of a Jeffrey Dahmer's uh, in, uh, in reverse. I mean, it, it gives back life and Jeffrey Dahmer didn't. Well, yeah, like most, uh, a lot of horror films, uh, a lot of the new kind of torture porn movies, they call them, like, yeah. um, I think are very uh, negative in a way because they, do, they only show torture and um, uh, murder and, and serial killers and, you know, who, who, who just annihilate people, whereas this character um, uh, resurrects them and brings them back to life. So it, it, it's, it is a kind of a um, conscious reversal of the, that kind of tendency. So it was a choice. Uh, it was a choice from the beginning to, I mean, it's a period where uh, torture porn is very hot. And yeah. I personally hate it. There's nothing in it. Yeah. And so I found this film very refreshing uh, for, for this uh, reason. Yeah, I was doing it, uh, that's for me, thanks. I was doing that uh, consciously, and but then, you know, I, uh, but on the other hand, I don't think that you can um, directly make some kind of moral judgment because, uh, in fact, a friend of mine uh, put me in touch with Camille Paglia when this whole censorship scandal happened in uh, Australia, and she told me basically, uh, she advised me not to try to defend my film on moral grounds because it's kind of like ridiculous because it's still it's still like a film that has extreme violence in it and and uh, and very and graphic sexuality which is fine but uh, you know um, I, 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 my defense of the film is more uh, about how it's a, it's a, a tradition in art I mean it's like an idea of this kind of uh, romantic character that goes back to um, the end of the 18th century with like Edgar Allan Poe or, or you know Charles Baudelaire who made who wrote works about um, death and creatures that were um, dead and coming back uh, sort of a, a kind of romantic attachment for people who had, had died that extended even to the grave. There's something that I was curious about. Uh, like, your zombie is, appears to be invisible to, to people, and I realized this when uh, he enters the donuts uh, shop, and there are two women that really don't, don't notice him at yeah. all, even if he has a, a zombie appearance. Is this, is this a way to suggest that he's not really as it appears to us, is schizophrenic, so Im I imagine to be a zombie, and he's really not? Yeah, I mean, it's it's partly, I mean, there's two things going on. There's that part that he's kind of invisible, and he kind of just blends into the, the, the background. Um, and that's, you know, that's just kind of saying that the homeless people are invisible as well. I mean, people just ignore them and pretend the whole situation isn't ha isn't happening, especially in Los Angeles, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, and the other thing is, you know, he's uh, it's very meant to be ambivalent in the film. Like he's he's kind of split a split character. Like he has a split identification. So you don't know if there's only one of him or if there's two of him. Like at a certain point at the en end of the film, he ends up watching himself from the window. Um, so th at that point, it's unclear whether he's split into two different entities or, or you know, mm -hmm. and which is another uh, kind of way of suggesting that things aren't what they might appear to be or to, um, to suggest that the, the whole movie might be from the point of view of someone who is, ha has a kind of schizophrenic mm -hmm. um, delusion or, uh, it's curious because now it's a time where uh, vampires are very hot in uh, in films and zombies were kind of forgotten. So 
you you brought them back, <laughs> which is good because. Uh, well, he's not really a. I mean, he is meant to be a zombie, but he's a very special kind of zombie, and I, I think uh, that's probably where the zombie movie will have to go next. Is I, th I think people are going to. It's it's sort of uh, annoying to me to see like a lot of zombie movies where it's the same thing re reiterated over and over again. These these worthless the zombies portrayed as worthless, homeless people that can just be annihilated for sport and that they have no personality and they're they're just yeah. kind of um, these uh, creatures that have no um, that are very conformist. They have no character. So I think that's probably where the zombie film will go on a certain level. Is it true that you were, uh, at the beginning, you were thinking about shooting this film in black and white? And if yes, why did you change your mind? Um, no, I don't think I ever, oh, okay. no. I mean, uh, my previous film, Otto, which is also about a, a gay zombie who could be a homeless person, um, you know, that was half shot in, in black and white. But that was... A, kind of conscious choice because the filmmaker within the film, the female, the lesbian filmmaker, um, makes black and white films, and so you see her films within the film. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, I mean, in fact, uh, L.A. Zombie really needed to be in color because it's, uh, it's kind of trying to capture that pop uh, energy that, that Los Angeles has, which is very specific. It has these very kind of almost, uh, you know, apocalyptic kind of hazy red colors and, and kind of like uh, sunsets and nuclear sunsets. And so it, to capture LA, it, I really needed to shoot it in color. Uh, about this, I know uh, LA quite well, and I found that it, your movie is really uh, show the real uh, city. Because it's not, it, it doesn't happen very often, and you're, uh, it captured the the essence. Like, it's some kind of noises too, the colors obviously. So it was kind of. Uh, well, the cars. The I mean, LA is all about the relentless yeah. cars, constantly going, whoosh, whoosh back, you know. So we, uh, uh, I did that in Hustler White as well, where I I like to shoot from across the street, uh, with a telephoto lens, and you have all these cars rushing by in the foreground, sort of, and uh, that's very authentically yeah. L.A. It is. It and then, is. of course, we shot, you know, a lot, we used uh, real homeless people. We shot with homeless, actual homeless people, so that that gives um, the movie a kind of authenticity. A question about the double version. Uh, it is known that you uh, usually shoot your films in both a soft and a porn version. Why this choice? I mean, is it commercial, or I mean, not not really. Um, it is kind of like a, the idea of cross promotion and and uh, marketing to different audiences. But it's really because my producer, who I've been with for twenty years, Jurgen Bruning, um, at a certain point in our development as filmmakers, he started a porn company, and. Um, uh, called Katzo film, and um, and then he continued to produce my movies. So, because I was um, making movies with a porn producer, it just kind of seemed logical to to work within the porn uh, business. I, I mean, he had actors that he worked with, porn actors that I could use. He had uh, a studio set up. That I could uh, editing suites, etc. That was all part of the porn company, so um, it was just kind of like a. It was also kind of like a self fulfilling prophecy. Like I started making my early films are like sexually explicit art films, and then because of them, I gained the reputation of being a pornographer, even though I wasn't making porn films at all, really, and it was certainly outside of the porn industry. But then because of our reputation, both Jurgen and I, as pornographers, we ended up, he ended up starting a, a real porn company. So it was almost like yeah. we were guided to this, you know, point of making actual porn films. Mm -hmm. Because I, 
I was curious about this because I know that your uh, produc the production companies for uh, Lay Zombie are porn production companies. And I was kind of curious to know how did they react to this project? Because it's explicit, okay? I haven't seen the expli uh, explicit version, but it, I, I know there is one. But it's not a porn movie. So I, I, I was curious about their reaction to the project. Well, part of it is, you know, the porn industry, like every, every, everything else, like the music industry, like uh, the film business, is uh, kind of in crisis and in transition because DVD sales are totally way down and there's pirating, illegal pirating of, of videos. And, and uh, so the whole industry is shifting and people are looking for new ways of generating income and also just uh, promoting their companies. So to do a film like um, LA Zombie actually, and the softcore version and have it like playing at high profile, uh, Film festivals gives a certain profile to the to the porn company. It's really good promotion for them. Um, but you know, these people are also uh, you know a lot of people that I run into who make porn. They just get really bored with doing you know making uh, straightforward porn movies, sex scenes, and they're actually quite uh, uh, keen to to try something different and do something more ambitious and. So, um, so that's part of it. Um, they're also um, looking to f find new audiences because. What kind you know, of distribution will this film have, for example, in the U.S.? Do you know already? I mean, it's difficult to say. We have an Italian um, distributor. They're they're putting out um, a, a package of Otto and and uh, L.A. Zombie. Um, in the U.S., it'll uh, Robert felt from Dark Alley under distribution, and he'll probably make a, a a deal with a larger distributor. We haven't. Uh, I don't think we've decided exactly, but you know, it's a, even the softcore version doesn't. It's it's as you know, it's it's pretty extreme. It's not. It's a more of a an experimental art film. It doesn't have a much of a plot or very little dialogue. So it's not like a tr uh, the kind of film that'll get a, a lot of theatrical play. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we're going to release both both versions on DVD and and, uh, um, dist and kind of promote and distribute them in separate channels. Oh, OK. Yeah. This is interesting because that never happens. Yeah, I mean, but I've, that's what I've done with my other two previous films, Skin Flick and Raspberry Rush. They were packaged differently. The Harker version is packaged under a different name and with different uh, uh, packaging and promoting. Uh, I was curious about knowing, how did you work with Joe Castro? Castro. Um, did you uh, explain to him what you wanted or did you follow his suggestions? Did you work together uh, from the beginning? Yeah, from the beginning, it was very collaborative. Um, we we discussed uh, in detail how we wanted the creature to look and how he was going to behave. And um, so, yeah, that was very collaborative. He has done a lot of uh, special effects for low budget horror films, so he already had some, you know, specific ideas about how he saw the creature looking um, based on his his style mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then I, I kind of adapted adapted it to my style for me basically it was about toning down his style which is v much more over the top much more kind of super super gore super uh, mm -hmm. extreme kind of baroque crazy uh, campy and I, I wanted to tone it down and make it a little more elegant and a little more aesthetic. Somehow. And about the music? The music, I, I mean, music is always very central to my films. And um, uh, I usually do a combination of, I, I put out on the internet, uh, on Facebook or whatever, MySpace, a notice saying I'm looking for a specific kind of music for a specific project. And then I get submissions. Um, 
and then I just choose w whatever music seems appropriate from that. Uh, but for this movie, I also got a composer that I met on Facebook uh, named Kevin Hoover uh, to compose some music in a specific style that I wanted for this movie, which was a kind of uh, a reference to Tangerine Dream mm -hmm. and Giorgio Moroder movies from the 70s. Like the main one I was thinking of was Paul Schrader's movie Cat People mm -hmm. with uh, Nastasia yes. Kinski. Which had a tangerine, which had a Giorgio Moroder um, score, and also this William Friedkin movie *Sorcerer* with Roy Schreider, Schreider um, had a *Tangerine Dream* score. So it was that kind of '70s electronic music sound. It was very specific, uh, um, and he composed like six tracks in that style. The last one. Do uh, okay. This is the second zombie movie. Are we should we expect the trilogy? Yeah, I have to. Okay. I mean, I want I want <laughs> to do glad. I want to do Detroit Zombie mm -hmm. because I really want to <laughs> shoot. <laughs> yeah, I want to shoot a, a movie in Detroit. I've never even been to Detroit, but oh, I okay. hear it's incredible because it's like a a city in in that's uh, a civilization in falling apart. I mean, the buildings are all decaying and abandoned. And, so I want to shoot there. But also I was just in South Africa. I was just in doing a theater project in Johannesburg and somebody introduced me to Nollywood, you know, the Nigerian mm -hmm. film industry. Yeah. So I want to do Nollywood zombie. Okay, that's and shoot it in, uh, and shoot it in Africa. We're looking forward for <laughs> whatever <laughs> you will really. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.